Welcome back, scholars, to Lesson 6-1.3, Genoa and Venice. Today we're going to spend a substantial part of this lesson talking about these two very important city-states in Italy and their role in the Silk Road trade and eventual Age of Exploration. Let's begin, however, by just once again circling back to the idea that Europe is an isolated outpost on this Silk Road. This map does a really good job of highlighting the real breadth of the Silk Road and how Asia is really interconnected by this. Africa is less so. Uh, do keep in mind though there's a couple of trade stations down this east coast as well, but when you move into Europe itself you're really just going through Italy. This is the European Silk Road and it keeps them barely connected to the rest of the world. Europe is not a major hub of trade at this point in uh, world history. Now, European access uh, to these goods do come primarily through two large trading cities. We have Genoa and Venice. Venice we have talked about a number of times, uh, Genoa a little bit less so. So we're going to take some time and really get into Genoa today, uh, but of course circle back to Venice as well. Now compared to the East and Middle East, Europe is it's, it's an outpost, which means you need to be transporting goods into European markets. That is what these two city-states are doing. They are trade middlemen. They are moving goods from one place to another. At least early on in this process, they're not producers. They're not making a lot of anything. They're just that connector. They're just the merchants of Europe, moving goods from one place to another. Now, the most important thing that they're moving around are luxury goods. You see, it's expensive to trade on the Silk Road for the Europeans. As we've gone through in past lessons, we're looking at the initial production, say, of black pepper in India, being transferred from uh, one place to another by the Arabs, passing through the Ottoman Empire with their taxation, their markups, finally going into Venetian hands before they go into European hands. Um, that's a lot of cost and a lot of markup. So only expensive goods are doing this. We're not moving the cheap stuff around. So mostly we're looking at spices, silks, and carpets being amongst the highest in demand. Silks we've talked about before. This is the Silk Road after all. Spices, we did a whole lesson on the importance of spices and we'll talk more about that in the future. Carpets are a good one to just bring into the general conversation because they are still traded in that area of the world today, and uh, Persians in particular make some of the finest carpets available. Now, with this luxury trade coming into Europe, the Europeans also want to participate. And the Italians, here we're talking about the Venetians and Genoese, are purchasing European go goods to sell on the market. They're purchasing goods like wool, Europe has lots of sheep. Uh, firearms, which the Europeans were becoming very good at producing. They'd learned from the Ottomans. And also slaves. As we've discussed in past lessons, they're uh, enslaving each other, but they're also increasingly uh, getting access to African slave markets. So those are going to be some of the things that the Europeans are producing. However, demand for those items is just not what it is for silk and spices. Everybody wanted silk and spices. These other items, eh, less so. Why do you need a lot of wool when you've got a lot of silk? I mean, come on, silk is nice. Wool is a little, you know, itchy. Uh, so the demand is just not as high. So Europeans need to pay for it in specie as well. Specie is valuable metals, in this case, gold and silver. So a lot of European wealth in the form of gold and silver is moving east for pepper. So 
Let's look at Genoa. Genoa is one of these two cities. Uh, here on this map, you can see Venice right here, and we have the Republic of Genoa located right there. There's the city of Genoa. Everything in yellow is controlled by the Genoese. You can see it in blown up version down here. So we're looking at the west side of Italy itself. Now they're going to increase their wealth and power throughout the Crusades. Uh, they're going to be in charge of moving a lot of troops around, and they'll also fight in some battles that will uh, be very advantageous to them. Most notably, in the area of the Black Sea. This is a map of the Black Sea area. Um, the Genoese are going to sail into that and start to capture some lands and establish some colonies throughout the Black Sea. And this is going to allow them, right down here, to have direct contact with Persia and to be trading with whomever is in control of Persia um, during this uh, 200 year stretch of time that the uh, Genoese are in the Black Sea. So that is going to give the Genoese access to the Silk Road. Now, unfortunately for the Genoese, once the Mongol Empire goes into decline, there's a lot of instability in the region. I've shown you this map on a previous lesson. We have the Safavids here and the Ottomans in pink, and a lot of instability throughout this region where the Safavids have access to the Black Sea. Uh, the Persian route through the Silk Road was more beneficial to the uh, Genoese than the direct trade with the Ottomans were. Um, some of that is just tax policy. Some of that is uh, alliances that developed over time. Um, so this instability is not good for Genoa. And as the uh, instability becomes greater and greater over the centuries, and particularly with Persia, the Safavids not doing very well, Genoa eventually shifts its focus over to finance. They become a little bit less involved in trade, actually a lot less involved in trade, and instead focus on being in a banking center, using the wealth that they already have, loaning it out to others, and earning interest in those transactions. Um, but, uh, Genoa will do well with this for a little while, but the advantage of having a large trade fleet is that when needed, you've also got a large military fleet. And as Genoa walks away from that, they're going to have longer term problems, which leads to Genoa not being as significant as our more important city state, Venice. You see, as Genoa is declining in power, somebody's got to suck up all that power and uh, take full advantage of it, and that will be the Venetians. The Venetians are going to take full control of the Eastern Mediterranean trade. And of course, by full control, I mean eh, most of the trade in Europe, not all of it. And eh, the Ottoman Empire is, you know, kind of involved in this too. Let's forget all that for a moment. Venice is important. Venice significantly benefits from the Genoese decline in power, particularly with the um, trade throughout this region and in the Black Sea where the Genoese are in severe decline. So the Venetians themselves, um, they have to be pragmatic in this. They're going to be trading uh, not just with the Byzantines as they had for a while um, when you know they weren't conquering Constantinople in the Fourth Crusade, mm. uh, but they're also going to be trading with the Ottomans and for a while with the Mamelukes. Um, these are the people who have access to the trade goods. The Venetians are a trading empire, and therefore they've got to work with the people who have the goods. This is what you need to do when your bread and butter is spices and silk. All Eastern goods sold in Europe, and again, I'm talking virtually all, are going to be passing through Venetian hands. If you want to wallpaper your cathedrals in gold, well, you're going to have to have a lot of money to do that. So having a monopoly is going to help you do that. A monopolies are good because, yeah, money. When you've got a monopoly, you can be rich. It's kind of at everybody else's expense, but the Venetians don't so much care about, you know, other people's expenses. So 
that leaves us with one last thing that we should touch on before we uh, wrap up this discussion on Venice and Genoa. And that is to say that both of them are participating in the slave trade. However, we need to have some clarifications here. Because when I'm talking about the slave trade and what gets it going for these two city-states, I'm talking about the European slave trade, not the African slave trade. Uh, access to the Black Sea, again, this area up here, leads to an increased trade in the residents of the Balkans. We're talking about people in the Black Sea area itself being captured and traded as slaves throughout the world. Interestingly, one of those groups, the before discussed Mamelukes, were fleeing the Mongol Empire, wind up in this area, wind up getting captured, enslaved, sold down to Egypt, where they overthrow the uh, empire down here, establish their own Mameluk empire, and these former refugees of the Mongols wind up being among the most successful military groups when fighting the Mongols. There was very few, really no, land armies other than the Mameluks that stood up to the Mongols in battle. So that's kind of a fun side story, but it's just to emphasize the fact that we are talking about the trade of peoples who had lived in European lands, um, the white slave trade, uh, as it's said in history in a few sources, um, is very much a part of the early Venetian and Genoese slave trade. However, as the Ottomans take more and more control of that region, and as Genoa has to leave the Black Sea. Genoa still wants to have some trade network, so they're going to have to shift. Venice has got the Eastern Mediterranean, so Genoa is going to be looking to North Africa, and it's going to shift its focus to the African slave trade. And it will be from the success that Genoa sees in this area of slaves moving up primarily out of West Africa through these trade routes and being sold in North Africa to Genoese merchants who then move them around, um, that Spain and Portugal will themselves get interested in African slave trade. And they'll model their early successes off of Genoa, and then boy, oh boy, do they ever expand it. Uh, but we will definitely be getting into that in great depth in the future. That's all for today. Thank you, and I will see you next time.